patients come in and they say, well, I have breast cancer and my mother had breast cancer, but we're gene negative. What, what happened? How, you know, how did I get breast cancer? And unfortunately, we don't always know how people get breast cancer, but basically one cell in the breast mutates. It's the job of the two cells next to it to repair it or to kill it and replace it with a normal cell, and somehow that repair process fails. There's a model called a tire cusick model, and this model helps us determine your 10-year and your lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. So with a model like this, we can determine how patients should be followed and if there are any actionable items. So in spite of the fact that some people are gene negative, um, sometimes the risk is very, very high. And as Molly mentioned, in some of the patients, the family history is so extensive, they're almost treated as if they're gene positive patients. And we have had patients, believe it or not, that have ultimately had preventative surgery because of extreme family history, even if they were gene negative. So it depends on circumstances. But there are several techniques to be able to help patients um, that are at high risk. So for example, if your lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is over 20%, it's a possibility that yearly breast MRI screening is necessary in addition to yearly mammography. And this is typically one of the thresholds that is covered by the insurance companies. And so 20% lifetime risk with the normal population adjusted risk typically in the United States or North America being about 12%. Now lifetime risk doesn't mean today, it means usually around age 85 or 90. So we also calculate your 10 year risk, but these numbers are very helpful in helping us how to follow patients. These are some of the things that may increase your risk. And some of these are obviously very, very common to you. Everybody knows about family history. People say, well, gosh, I'm, I'm older now. I don't have to worry about this, right? Well, actually, the risk of breast cancer typically increases with age, obviously mutations. So it appears that as women's menstrual cycles have gone from 18 or 16 or 14 or 12 to 12 and 10, that the risk of breast cancer may have increased, and is that potentially related to increased exposure to your own circulating estrogen levels over the course of a lifetime? So with the earlier age of onset of menses, your risk actually goes up. Alcohol, people don't like to talk about a whole lot, but it was originally proven that if you're an alcoholic, your risk of breast cancer could be as much as 40 to 70 percent higher than the general population. Uh, to drink alcohol is fine, but uncontrolled alcohol use for um, decades dramatically increases your risk. Um, you don't have to be a fitness instructor, but unfortunately, if you uh, become obese after menopause, it increases your risk. And it's not a comfortable thing to talk about. I certainly am not a fitness instructor. You can look at me and tell that, although <laughs> my wife is. I don't get complete credit because she is. Um, so I'm far from perfect, but we like to discuss with people what their individual risk factors are, and, and these are some of us, and this is some of the information used in calculating your risk. So there's one other thing that I, a, a few other things that I want to mention to you, and actually I'd like to go back. I don't know if this will go back. What are the modifiable risk factors? Let's say that we know that you're at increased risk. That's very helpful information. How are we going to follow you? Well, there's multiple opportunities to potentially help a person that's increased risk. And the first we talked about in our whole lecture series is diet, nutrition, exercise, and decrease alcohol consumption. And it's a favorite topic of ours because, as you probably know, my wife, uh, Rosemary, is a dietitian, and she exercises a lot, so I've learned a lot from her. Um, but that's not interesting to everyone, but it is interesting to me, but it was the part of our first series of lectures and they're on the website and we can discuss it further. But it's nice to know that cardiovascular exercise and an appropriate diet and minimizing alcohol consumption are significant breast cancer risk reducers. Um, if you don't do all those things, it doesn't mean that you need to feel guilty and that you did something wrong, but patients want to know what can I do to decrease my risk going forward. So the next opportunity is close surveillance. And close surveillance can be participation in our office in a high-risk clinic, which can include professional breast exams every six months, yearly mammography. Sometimes in patients, particularly those patients with dense breast tissue, 3D tomosynthesis mammography may be appropriate. So it's a certain specific type of mammogram 
designed for patients that may have increased breast density that are also at increased risk. It's conceivable it may become the norm one day. Um, unfortunately, it's not 100% covered by insurance now, so unfortunately there's a slight extra charge for 3D tomosynthesis and mammography outside of your insurance coverage. It's office, obviously offered at Dar Shaheen and has been for many, many years. The bottom line with 3D tomosynthesis mammography is it decreases the chance of a callback. A callback means you had a screening mammogram, they thought they might have seen something, so they call you back for additional views. And it's a little more sensitive, so it also decreases the chance of a miss. So this is very important in our patients that are increased risk. Breast MRI scanning yearly, potentially rotated at a six month interval with mammography and breast ultrasound. So the first option is modifiable risk factors. The second is close surveillance. The third is risk reduction by medication, by meeting with medical oncology. Sometimes the drug tamoxifen is used prior to the age of 50. Sometimes a Remedex and other drugs are used after the age of 50. There's some people that feel like this is one of the most underutilized risk reduction techniques that we have. There's some stories about side effects, some of which are true, maybe some of which are exaggerated. I think you'd be foolish not to meet with medical oncology and at least discuss these medications and learn what the risk reduction are. Patients say to me, well, I'm not going to take it because my neighbor had this problem. And I said, you know, I'm not sure what that has to do with you, uh, first of all. But second of all, whatever the percent is, Dr. Sickus is here, Dr. Reed here, whatever the percent of patients that take the medication with no side effects at all or with minimal side effects enjoy a tremendous risk reduction. So why would you not attempt the medication for at least a three-month trial, and if you don't have these side effects, you may be one of the people that has this dramatic improvement in risk reduction by taking the medication. So to me, it's a little short-sighted to say my neighbor had a problem with it, I'm not taking the medication. Um, and the consultation is educational. People will say, Bill Barber didn't tell me all this. Well, I may not know as much about it as a medical oncologist, but it's a complete consultation about risk reduction with a medical oncologist. So preventative or prophylactic surgery. Some patients' risk are so high, or there may, be medic, there may be other reasons that they cannot take some of these medications. For example, some patients with a history of blood clots may not be a good candidate for tamoxifen and that sort of thing. So there is preventative and prophylactic surgery, which by the way has improved dramatically because as I hope you realize one of the current techniques for preventative surgery is a nipple sparing mastectomy with immediate reconstruction. So hopefully gone are the days with large incisions for the vast majority of patients. Many incisions now are hidden. So it's very, very safe for many of our patients to have a nipple sparing procedure, which means basically all the overlying skin is preserved, the nipple is preserved, the areolar skin is preserved. You go beneath the skin, remove the breast tissue, and they have um, an immediate reconstruction. So as far as what in the world does the power of caring mean, and the power of caring is simply a login to um, the support that many of our patients have from their family and friends that allow them to do amazingly well with their cancer treatment. And it's no secret that the patients that have this sort of support can go through treatment. Imagine chemotherapy, radiation therapy, et cetera, with the support of a loved one versus those that do not have it. I have a patient right now, 45 years young, has a horrible breast cancer that unfortunately has been neglected, that's divorced, and when Arrington, our nurse navigator, called her, she said, who do you have? He said, I, I don't have anyone. Who will be coming to chemotherapy with you? I have no one to come to chemotherapy with me. So imagine that versus the support that some of our patients have. So the patients shown here have been consulted and have agreed to allow us to tell their story to help you. So this is Patty Lawrence. Patty Lawrence is the number one ranked triathlete in the United States for women 50 or older. She just went through breast cancer treatment. She had a mastectomy, reconstruction, and post-mastectomy radiation. And in one month, she'll compete in Hawaii for the Ironman Triathlon, which she was originally favored to win. And she said, I don't think I'm going to win this year, but I certainly plan to win next year. 
So this is the amount of support that she's had from her family and friends to allow her. So when I spoke to her over the weekend, she said, it's a perfect time you call it. I just rode 112 miles on my bike. <laughs> so this is Cindy Ferguson and her family. Um, Cindy went through breast cancer. She went through chemotherapy. Cindy was very, very interested in preserving her hair and has been very helpful in our program um, with the Piedmont Cancer Institute. Um, Dignicap, is that correct, Vasily? Dignicap is the program that's taken the place of cold caps where some of the patients can preserve their hair during chemotherapy. So Cindy's been very helpful in that regard. Her husband actually is a member of the Oncology Foundation Board and has helped us tremendously uh, with donations. Some of you may know this next person. This is Hollis Younger. This is her daughter, Hayes. Hollis is uh, one of our dearest patients from Atlanta. And Hollis, is, Hollis lives in Brunswick. Her, um, her husband is an architect in the area. And Hollis is undergoing treatment, chemotherapy, which he's now been undergoing off and on for two, three, or four years at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. And her parents said to her, you will never go to an appointment without us being there. And so whenever she has an appointment in the Mayo Clinic, if it's on six hours notice, they'll stop what they're doing and they'll go be with Hollis. And they've offered a tremendous amount of support to Hollis and her daughter. Her husband is not pictured here, but her daughter is. This to me is an incredible story. So this nice lady said, it's okay, you can tell my story. There's a video that goes with this, as you can see. She's an attorney, her husband's an attorney, they met in law school, and as they were getting engaged, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And one of her husband's friends, let me make sure I say this correctly, one of her husband's friends came to him and said, your fiance has breast cancer? You're about to marry damaged goods. You're gonna to have to cut bait and move on while you still can, you're going to be stuck. You're going to be permanently stuck. Do you not know how serious this is? You've got to go to her and tell her the engagement's off. So this is an amazing video that we won't get to see tonight, but hopefully in a future session, with her husband's response to his friend <laughs> who said, you cannot marry your fiance because she's got breast cancer. And he said, you must have some sort of misunderstanding about love and commitment and a few basic concepts. Uh, of course I'm going to get married. So it's a very touching story of what his response was to his friend. So what we have found is that these patients have gone through this incredible amount of support and we have tried to accomplish the same in our practice for those that do have that support and those that do not. And so that's the goal of Atlanta Breast Care, it's the goal of Piedmont Cancer is to do something special that others have not been able to do, whether it's to give you our personal cell phone number, or whether it's to call you the night before surgery, or whether it's to attach you to our nurse navigator, Arrington, who does an amazing job. But everybody knows there's a secret weapon in our office, and it's not me, <laughs> and it's Jennifer. So everyone knows Jennifer. So we hope Jennifer will work forever. We've asked Jennifer many times if she has a twin sister, and apparently the answer to that is so far is no. <laughs> but this is what we try to utilize is this family support that has enabled our patients to do better. And that's it.